Jackie Sadek and Peter Bill are co-authors of Broken Homes, Britain's Housing Crisis, Faults, Factoids and Fixes. Peter is former editor of both Building Magazine and Estates Gazette, while Jackie is a regeneration specialist, former advisor to MHCLG and COO of UK Regeneration, which is developing a 1500 home garden village in Biggleswade. So Jackie, can we start uh, by you telling me how the book came about in the first place? Well, first to say, Peter, thank you very much indeed for having us. We're a great admirer of the Peter Murray podcast, so it's a great honour to be in the in the pantheon of those. Um, so I think you kind of put your finger on it in the introduction. Uh, Peter Bill is an analyst. Uh, he's been in and around this industry for more decades than I will say here, because it's not fair. Um, and he has a sort of institutional memory of the property sector, which is second to none. And I am a sort of visceral player who's out there trying to prove that you can do things differently. I'm unashamed market disruptor trying to do some decent homes in Bedfordshire, which is actually quite hard. Um, so what you've got is a kind of um, a cerebral analyst that are kind of matched up with a kind of howl of indignation, if you like. Um, we also happen to be old mates uh, and we've known one another for oh, a good two, three decades. In fact, I think at one point, Peter was my sister's boss, you know, we go back um, way before, uh, in fact, uh, you know, when I started writing for the Estates Gazette, uh, it was during Peter's era, so, you know, we, we go back and uh, we've been mates for a long, long time. And we met up for lunch in um, the Reform Club, as, as you do, Peter's very posh, you understand, so he's a member of the Reform Club, uh, and we met up for lunch and I was wringing my hands about the housing crisis and how little it was understood. And also about my own story, the UKR story, and how I'd like to write it up. And um, over a glass of rather splendid Chablis, we hatched up a plot um, to write it up, uh, to write about the housing crisis, but also use my own company and my own, my own experience as a worked example. And bizarrely, although we come at it very differently, he, the brains, and me, the emotions, it actually kind of works. The conflation of the two things kind of works. So that's what you see at the end of the day. Um, of course, we finished uh, just as lockdown hit us in March. And then we, we kind of sat there with this book, not knowing whether our timing was absolutely brilliant or abysmal. We weren't quite sure which way it was going to go. Of course, one of the findings we come up with is, you know, the UKR motto, which is everyone deserves better, which also includes, I might tell you, um, space standards and, and, and room sizes. And obviously that's been a big old topic during the pandemic. So in a funny sort of way, we've been on the money. Um, but the housing crisis, as you know, Peter has been with us for oh, probably a good five decades in the making. It's going to take probably take several decades to get us out of it. And it will forever be there. Once we get out of the pandemic, you know, we have to meet other crises, don't we? We have to meet Brexit. We have to meet the climate change emergency. We also still have the perennial housing crisis. So we kind of hope the book will be current for some years to come. Certainly we enjoyed writing it and um, it was almost cathartic, dare I say, uh, to get it off our chests. Very good. Well, you updated it very well. It certainly feels very much of the moment as one reads it. And uh, at the start of the book, Peter writes a, a really wonderful imaginary development story. It talks about all the problems that the development faces during the process. There's a recurring character, Sir Ron Pincher, a savvy developer who does well out of ensuring he can never build more than he can sell. And Peter sets out four fallacies of the current housing debate. So, Peter, first of all, tell me, who is Sir Ron based upon and what are the four fallacies? Sir Ron is, of course, an amalgam of the late, great Tony Pidgeley and the worst side of about half a dozen other house builders who I dare not name. Uh, Jackie and I have known knew Tony for many years and we're re really fond. We're really both quite fond of him. Uh, and he comes to mind as the uh, as a builder who cared about building things. So that's who Sir Ron is. Um, the fallacies, well, I think the first fallacy is there is a housing crisis. That's because we only need to build 170,000 houses a year, according to the Office of National Statistics, for the next 20 years. That's quite enough, thank you very much, for household formation purposes. That doesn't mean to say there isn't a crisis. The crisis is one of affordability, uh, not quantity. Um, people just can't afford to buy them. 
but we only actually need 170, yet we're shooting for 300. And we're shooting for 300 in the fallacious um, concept that it will bring down prices, which is probably bringing us to the uh, second fallacy, which is that if you build lots of houses, the prices will come down, which is complete nonsense. House prices, new house prices, generally about 20% above old house prices, are of course pegged to the price of old houses, not other new houses. And to add one or two percent a year to the 24 million, whatever it is, houses, even if you doubled it to 500,000 houses a year, it wouldn't bring down the price of houses. Of course it wouldn't. And that's the second fallacy, that house prices will reduce somehow if we build more homes. Um, I think that the third fallacy is the one of um, if you improve the planning system and allow more land to be zoned for housing, houses will magically appear on this zoned land. Um, that's nonsense too. You have to only look at the island. Of, let's take the Isles of, you know, uh, the Shetland Isles, for instance. If you said, if you said, every piece of land on the Shetland Isles can have a house on it. You don't need to build any houses on it because nobody wants to build, no, not that many people want to live in the Shetland Islands. And it's the same all over. You don't necessarily get homes by zoning land for homes. You only get homes once the builders of those homes are prepared to take the capital risk to build them. And when they build them, you will notice they only sell them at somewhere between 0.7 and 1 a week which is another recurring theme of the book. They do that for perfectly good reasons. That is the economically most efficient way of selling your homes. If you sell more than one a week, you put the prices up so it goes down to 0.7 again. If you sell less than uh, 0.7 a week, you offer free kitchens until it goes back up to 0.7 a week. That's th that uh, sales per outlet per week has been there for decades. And house builders will tell you, as it says in the book, that's the rate at which they sell, even in a even in a boom, and not not in a bust, but in a boom. So that's the third fallacy. The fourth fallacy, which we can talk about a little later as well, is that modern methods of construction are somehow going to solve the problem. We can come back to the technicalities of it in a minute or two, but. Um, the idea that if you build houses, if you bolt houses together, they'll somehow be cheaper to buy or rent is, of course, another fallacy. You don't, when you buy a house, you, they don't sell it to you more cheaply because they've made it more cheaply. They sell it to you for the market price and the same goes for the rent. So those are the four fallacies, if you like, and we can come back to the MMC technical stuff in a minute. Yeah, now I'd like to uh, ask you a bit about, uh, in a minute, about uh, what you don't like about MMC. But uh, before that, Jackie, I, I mean, I sense a slightly different approach to what a good housing development looks like between the two of you. I'm uh, reading between the lines. I, Peter seems to want everyone to have plenty of car parking spaces. While well, you mention disincentivizing the private car, uh, talking about cycleways, uh, walkways and allotments with your architects. I mean, how, how much are you two aligned on what actually makes a good development? Uh, well, we're probably aligned about 96%, but you have put your finger right on the two very pleasurable uh, disputes that we had during the course of writing the book. The first one, so you quite rightly say on car parking, um, Peter and I both agreed that it's everybody's democratic right to own a car, but of course I am wrestling with a local authority who wants me to do three car parking spaces per residence on my development. Uh, worse than that, my community would like me to do a, a car parking space for every bedroom so for instance if I'm doing a five bedroom house they would like to see five car parking spaces and even then they're thinking they're saying to me well actually you probably need six because we probably need one for the visitor um you know so I mean it is a bit of an arms race uh, probably not in London but certainly out in Middle England, um, in, in, in the Oxford Cambridge corridor in particular, people are very dependent on their cars and, and achieving some sort of modal shift will be very, very hard. And I'm working very, very hard on it. In fact, this afternoon, I'm in meetings with 
various uh, people from the DFT about cracking this exact problem. Transport for New Homes put out a think tank piece about how um, garden villages are predicated on the use of the private car and therefore are slightly eroding their offer and I'm determined to show that you can do it differently. So Peter and I had a, a very pleasurable series of arguments about this. And the other thing we argue about, funny enough, is in fact MMC um, and whilst I agree with him completely about the fact that it won't reduce the price of housing, I do see and I take the Mark Farmer position very firmly on this that we need to modernise the construction industry, we need to do that quite fast and that actually MMC is a proxy for modernising and not to put too far the point in it, you wouldn't build a car the way you did when you, you know, 100 years ago, and actually you shouldn't be building houses the way you did 100 years ago. Uh, but he and I are on slightly different wickets there. Of course, he's quite hard to argue with, Peter, because he's a proper QS and he's properly trained. So he can really blind you with a, with a series of numbers that will prove that you've got a rather a rather precarious position in terms of the actual the, the, the metrics and the numbers. But it's been very, very pleasurable rowing with him about all of this. Uh, car parking, I think, is something that all people dealing with new housing developments are struggling with and I think this has got a way to go before we find the solutions and you know a lot of work needs to be done. I just need to defend the car parking for just 30 seconds or so. Sure. Could I ask all, who's, all who are watching this from the architectural profession to stop looking at CGI's of housing estates and go and look at what they actually are like when they're finished and about two years later. They tend to be jammed with cars. And the biggest mystery is the garages tend to be empty because they're too small for today's cars. Garages are almost, they're like potting sheds. They're, they're, they're not used for cars anymore. And the idea that you should design garages for cars is needs re-looking at, frankly. Why they are not used for cars is because they are used for storage, because there is not enough storage room inside the house. 80% of the garages I looked at on one site were empty of cars and filled with toot. And that's because the houses were tiny on the particular estate I look at uh, in the book. Uh, MMC, very, uh, that's my, I've got that out of my chest. The MMC thing, do you trust an industry that has brought us Grenfell, uh, that has brought us the timber frame debacle in the 1980s, that has brought us um, the sort of, the fallout from Grenfell, which is a re-looking at all these blocks of flats, especially in London, that are, they, well, they haven't done the work properly. Um, and do you look at a system that I can see it's necessary to build bathrooms and stuff like that, bathrooms and interiors. I think the idea that we've got to go helter skelter for it because there are labour shortage is 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 a nonsense. I think that um, you know labour comes and goes, and they'll just have to put up the, how much they pay the labourers to do it. I think that I think that it's. The bigger worry is the government becoming involved in modern methods of construction. I don't think it's any of their business to become involved in what should be purely something run by the private sector. They take the risks, but what we've got is a government determined for reasons that are in Mark Farmer's report uh, to get dabble in it. So they're giving out money to build factories. They are insisting that Homes England get involved in it and what happens when it goes wrong but mark my word mark my words it will go wrong some of them will go wrong and then who do you sue and the answer is there will be nobody left to sue take a look what happened in new zealand the leaky home scandal in new zealand which is right at the back of the book is a case study in what goes wrong when you start doing things that aren't supervised by government uh, that that uh, that allow shoddy work to be done. Peter and I have both agreed that we are at a tipping point on MMC, partly because we've already mentioned the late great Tony Pidgeley. Tony was already moving into this market. Now you know and I know that Tony's the great bellwether of the housing industry, was the great bellwether of the housing industry. Let's hope Barclay can continue to be so. But the fact that he was moving decisively into MMC 
is very interesting and I think quite um, encouraging. It was, however, as Peter says rightly, only on the interiors. It was bathrooms, it was kitchens, it wasn't, it was the, the, the houses themselves were remaining traditionally built. Yes, but I, I would say to Peter though that uh, you only have to listen to a couple of days of the Grenfell Inquiry to show that the industry itself has not regulated uh, what it does in a suitable way and government actually has to get involved and, and you actually hear horror stories now from developers and housing associations who are taking panels off construction, seeing what's behind and finding absolute horrors of uh, things that have been done. And in fact, talking about Tony Pidgeley, you know, they, their, their housing estate in West London, where they had one uh, block go up, I mean, that they found huge problems there. Uh, and so the industry does need greater government control, doesn't it? In that uh, I, would, I would agree with you on the, on the standard side of it. Uh, even when I was at Building Magazine, I found that the relationship between the material suppliers and the and the uh, recently uh, freed up BRE and British Board of Agramont was far too cosy. And it remains so to this day. And basically the material manufacturers set their own standards. So yes, there needs to be at that level much more stringent government standards. But what is never, you can't um, legislate for a wet and windy site in Huddersfield in 10 years time, when some slightly flaky version of uh, MMC, which includes brick slip panels being stuck on with, um, uh, with mastic and clips, uh, and the subcontractor, subcontractor, subcontractor has just found three guys off the street to come and do it. You can't legislate for that sort of stuff, and so you shouldn't allow it to happen. It's Murphy's Law that everything that can go wrong on a building site will at some point go wrong. Not suggesting that the big responsible house builders will go wrong. They're, they pro hopefully won't, but what will happen is one of the second tier or third tier people will go wrong. It will be seen to have been a system which has been given a, the go ahead by the NHBRC and whoops, it's gone wrong. And what that does, it blackens the name of the entire sector. And that's, I can guarantee you, that's what will happen at some point in the future. Just to finish, let me just ask each of you, um, if there were three things the government were to do in response to your book, what would they be? Uh, Jackie, let's start with you. Uh, well, I think the first thing would be to encourage the stewarded model. So this is the sort of thing that Urban and Civic and Grosvenor are already doing. Homes England are moving decisively into this space, and I am following with my own company. However, there are there is there is scope to do an awful lot more in, in my in, the, in in my view in that regard, and particularly with local authority land. Um, and I think you know custodians of place who are in it for the long time should be should be keeping a careful grip on the master plan whilst putting out plots to house builders and letting them do what they do well uh, whilst making sure that you've actually created a proper place so and I think there are indications that that is actually happening so I'm, I'm quite like the stewarded model uh, altogether uh, the second thing I would do would be to shelve planning reform until we're going to do it properly frankly but that's you know again Peter as you said we could talk about that all day all day and all night um, nobody in the country that is is a is I was going to say a victim of the planning system but is involved in the planning system uh, wouldn't say it didn't need reform but I'm afraid the current proposals really are not it so I would quietly shelve all of those really and the third thing I would do would be acknowledge quite carefully and completely and upfront that house builders particularly private sector house builders are not in the business of housing the nation and I think help to buy in particular is an economically illiterate policy that should be phased out I think it's quite a tough thing to do in a pandemic but I would be starting to think about the demise of help to buy which although it's very very popular policy and has been very effective I think is storing up problems for later. Thanks. Peter what would you ask the government to do? Uh, <clears throat> well I would, I would like to wave my uh, magic wand over about uh, three things as you say. The first thing I would do is on space standards. I think that you should at least make the current minimum space standards mandatory. That would drag up from the floor 
some of the smaller homes that we talk about in the book. So that would be a start. Uh, and then secondly on that, so that, that would be the first wish. Our ultimate wish is that they should be made 25% larger than the current space standards. That is our second wish. And to achieve the second wish, I think it should be possible to impose 25% higher space standards and significantly lower density uh, standards on one or two new towns that haven't yet been built, as most of them haven't. And I think the land values would support that. So that's the second thing. The third thing is really aimed at more at your listeners and viewers than others. We've got this concept of beauty that's floated in like a butterfly in the last six months or so. It doesn't really mean a lot, but it's well-meaning. And it needs defining, it needs numbers in it, it needs you can't have this bigger than that and that should be that far away from this. At the moment you can, you, you can define beauty as anything you like, uh, and, but it is a good idea and so it needs to have some scaffolding built within it with some numbers in it saying, like Tudor Walters did a hundred years ago, saying 70 feet from here to there, 20 feet from there to there, the houses should be 24 feet wide, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's how you define beauty, that's how the scaffolding of beauty is built. And as part of that, I think the final point I would make is there's a whole chapter in the book called the Ghosts in the Machine. And the ghosts in the machine are the people that live in the houses that have been ignored by the design professions, by the planning system, and by house builders apart from the people to sell houses to for decades. There is nothing in any of the literature that addresses this issue in a serious way at all. We don't know how people live, and if we do, we choose to ignore it. Thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, Jackie and Peter, thank you uh, for uh, commenting on your book, which I have to say is a really good read. I do advise uh, uh, architects, developers and students to uh, get hold of a copy and I'll put a link on the website here so that you can do that. But it, it's, it's a very good read. They're fascinating uh, uh, comments. Thank you very much indeed. And I wish we had a lot longer to discuss them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Very good.